Well, we were looking last time at the subject, God as Spirit. Tonight we're going to take up where we left off. Actually, we just introduced it. So tonight I want to use that introduction as a basis for what we're going to be talking about. We said that perhaps the best way to begin is to contrast what God is with what we are. God is spirit. In John 4.24, which is our text, Jesus said God is spirit, not a spirit, but spirit, speaking of his nature. So he said, because he's spirit, we have to worship him as spirit in a spiritual way, not in a ritualistic, formalistic, humanistic, idolatrous way. God is spirit, we said, man has spirit. Man has a spirit. Man is flesh, God is spirit. In fact, the scriptures contrast them. We said, too, that man is the adjective and God is the noun. Man is spiritual, God is spirit. We said, too, as spirit, God is presented in the Bible in two aspects. As to his nature, our being, God is spirit. But one of the eternal manifestations of that being, our nature, is the Holy Spirit. Remember, you can't divide God up, but we're dealing not with the triunity of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but we're speaking of God. God is spirit. And so as to his nature, he is spirit, but when he manifests the nature, it is the Holy Spirit. Of course, we've already covered that Jesus Christ is God, so we're not talking about his incarnation and whatever. He was spirit before the incarnation, but you see now he is forever God-man in a glorified body. So we're thinking of God as God, not as the triune God in other studies. But here, God when he manifests his nature, then we call him the Holy Spirit. So tonight we want to try to come to some understanding of what Jesus meant. At least begin, we'll be on it probably a few weeks. When he said God is spirit, what did he mean? Well, let's look at what it means for God to be spirit, first of all. We see that God is spirit, first of all, by logical implication. Now, we're studying New Testament theology. That's why we make some of these statements like this to help us better understand what John 4.24 meant. But by logical implication, God is spirit. What we mean by that is this, that since spirit, not finite matter, but spirit is the highest form or order of existence that's possible. Since spirit and not created or finite matter is the highest form of existence possible, then the creator of all things must himself be of the highest order possible. In other words, when you conceive of God, the highest conception of him is that he's spirit, not something finite, created, not something limited by time or distance, but pure spirit. That's just logical. Now, in Romans 1.20, Paul states that it is. In 1.20, he says that man, from observation of the created order, man, from his observation of the created universe, can come to the conclusion that there is an invisible spirit or creator. Obviously, he's invisible. For the invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So he says that man can reason from nature, creation up to a creator. And of course he's invisible, and only spirit is invisible, in case you didn't know. He can't see him, but he can reason up to the fact that there is a creator. Which is what makes him without excuse. 
He didn't do that and doesn't do it often, but he's going to be without excuse because he can do it. Remember the studies in Romans, he goes on to say that man turned the creature into the creator, and he worships the alligators and the statues and pictures and so forth. Birds, moon, sun, stars. We're talking about from just logical implications, you can see that God, if he's God, would be spirit. Another aspect along this line is that all man sees is decay, change, and the death of the whole material universe. And therefore, because all he sees is change and decay and death, that which is greater than any of that would have to be changeless, our spirit. And only spirit, as we'll see, and as you should already know, is immortal, changeless, doesn't change at all. And again, since man knows intuitively that his own mind, our spirit, is of a higher order than the brain by which he thinks or his mind functions. Since we know intuitively that our minds are of a higher order than the brain or the body, then we know that God must be of the highest existence possible, namely spirit. In other words, you know that you, the thing that's thinking, and some of you looking up here, some of you writing, and your mind's working, you know that that mind by which you identify as a personality, the you is greater than the house that we're looking at, the body. Or you can take the brain out, and you see that'll decay and return to dust. But the spirit, just by logical implication, is greater than the brain that enables it to function. Or the mind, we're here using them interchangeably. So by logical implication, you could carry that on. Another reason we say that God is spirit, or we know that he's spirit, is from the declarations of scriptures themselves. Because that's what the scriptures tell us. We know that God is spirit from John 4:24, God is spirit. Over in Hebrews 12:9, God is called the father of spirits. In other words, he's the one that produces spirit. I didn't say create because you don't create spirit. Spirit is uncreated. But he's called the father of spirits, so he must be spirit to be able to produce it because he gives spirit to everything that has life. In Philippians 2, 5 and following, you see that Jesus Christ, before he became flesh, was invisible spirit. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, see that is spirit, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, he emptied himself and took upon himself the form of man, you see. So he's contrasting form of God with form of man are the nature, our being of God with that of man. So by declaration there in Philippians 2, 5 and following, the apostle states that his earthly form was not his original form or his heavenly form, which was the God form or invisible spirit. And you can compare with that, since this is New Testament theology, we do make some references to the Old Testament, but compare with that, Isaiah 31.3, God says through Isaiah, Isaiah 31.3, that he's not like created flesh, but he is spirit. In other words, he contrasts his nature with horses who are flesh. Israel's trusting in horses, but he says, I'm not flesh, I'm spirit. And then thirdly, we see that God is spirit from scripture teaching, that is doctrine. We see this first of all because the scriptures, the doctrine concerning God, one of the doctrines, tells us he's eternal. So his eternalness 
shows us that he is spirit because only spirit is eternal. Anything created is finite. God is infinite, eternal. Not that they're the same things, but anything created is finite, and its finitude consists in the fact that it was created. Because anything that has a beginning has to have a what? An ending, of course. Only spirit would have no beginning or ending. We have a spirit, and angels are spirits and so forth, but you see, they all come from God. And like Solomon said, at death they go back to God, in the sense it's from God and His. Now, we've already covered all of that in biblical theology. You have to make your little references to your notes you take to say, listen to this or check it in biblical theology. We dealt with all the details of that, that it's God's spirit, but when he gives it to man, the scriptures then speak of it as man's spirit. In other words, my spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, man consists of body, soul, and spirit, Paul says. But it's still from God. So there's no creation of spirit. God simply imparts spirit. We'll see what spirit is later, but he simply imparts spirit to that which he gives life to. Without spirit, there'd be no life. See, there's no soul apart from Adam being created out of the dust of the earth, and God breathed into him spirit, and he became a living soul. The soul is a person. We'll get to that, but we've already been to that many times. So his eternalness, only spirit can be eternal. Anything created is finite. And saying that God is eternal, as the Bible does, is just another way of saying God is spirit because only spirit is eternal. Everything else is in the process of change, decay, and death. Everything in the universe, including you. But because man is spiritual, has his life from God, then, of course, once he comes into existence, becomes a living soul or a personality, then that is eternal. That being will remain for all eternity. But it had a beginning, and so it's finite. Romans 1.20, 1 Timothy 1.17 tell us that God is eternal. Now we'll say more about eternity later too, although that's in detail on biblical theology tapes. But to say that God is eternal doesn't imply that he's involved in any way in time. But I won't save that for later. What I'm trying to say at this point, that eternity is not to be confused with endless time. Eternity has nothing to do with time. Time was created, but we'll say more about it. And to say that God is eternal is to say that he's spirit, or to say that he's spirit is to say he's eternal. Man as a personality, unlike God, who never had a beginning, has a beginning when spirit and body unite, he becomes soul. Genesis 2, 7, a living soul. And again, to be repetitious, all of that is on the biblical theology tapes, as well as Old Testament, I suppose. And I say that to remind you that sometimes you've got to go back and re-listen to some things. You can't absorb it all because we went through it once. So first of all, from Scripture teaching, we see that God is spirit because when the Scripture says he's eternal, then only spirit can be eternal. Name something that can be eternal that isn't spirit. Nothing. I don't care whether you're talking about a galaxy out there, the air in this room, you, whatever. Everything is in the process of change, decay, and death. Everything, even the universe. Even those granite mountains won't be there, say, if the world lasted a billion years, but God will still be there. So everything is changing except spirit. Now, if you have a question, you're permitted to ask, but if you observe, I'm going a little slowly tonight so that you can think through some of these things. My, I'll tell you, time's short. You better think while you're here because... You might not get home. The Lord may 
come with a shout and say, where's my army? Gideon's army. And 52 of you have to say, I'm not ready. I wasn't listening tonight. I was there. I got it in my notebook somewhere. Or, oh, I was so busy or tired. He might tell you, the very thing you got taught tonight is the thing you need so you can walk on that water and whatever. Well, not chiding, just admonishing. So we just say, if you don't write, listen real good. I don't know how a mother with one, two, three, four kids could be taking notes, but there's no excuse for her not getting it out of the tape library. I mean, if my own wife, she listens to all the ministry here, but she gets the tapes right away and listens to it again. Hello out there. <laughs> you know, your wife's the one that knows you. And the wife often has the least respect for a husband and vice versa. You know, just be realistic. You should respect one another. So all I'm saying is wives may hold babies, but God isn't going to let you get out of your responsibility of getting your heart prepared just because you're a wife or a mother. Another doctrine that shows God is spirit is his omnipresence. Now, omni means all and presence. You know what that means. It means he's everywhere present. Psalm 139, 7 to 10. And so David says, where shall I go from thy spirit? God is spirit. See, David can run, but he can't run from God because God is everywhere as spirit. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? And whither shall I flee from thy presence? That must mean his presence is everywhere. If I send up into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. Well, of course, that's good. You know, he can't get away from God's presence as a believer. He doesn't want to, but the point is that teaches omnipresence. Then look at Jeremiah 23, 23, 24. Jeremiah 23, verses 23, 24. Omnipresence. Only spirit can be omnipresent is the point. Matter, created matter, finite matter, is limited to one place. At one time, at least. I mean, if you take a vacation to Europe, you're still not omnipresent. You're just over there. But God's already over there and here. Amen. Praise the Lord. 23, 24. Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God also afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? <laughs> now heaven's a big place. Even the created heaven, you've got a first heavens where the birds fly and the airplanes, and you've got outer space, second heaven, and Paul said he went up to the third heaven, that's God's dimension, or he went into the third heaven, whether it's up or straight across or wherever, because in the spiritual dimension you don't have ups and downs, and we'll get to that later too. <laughs> Even the created space is almost infinite as far as seeing. Just think, billions, not millions, well, it won't hurt for you to hear it again. <laughs> Most of you never had any studies in astronomy. Some of you did in astrology and got delivered from that, but astronomy is <laughs> something else. But we've got billions of stars, which are really suns, as big or bigger than our sun in our galaxy, our universe. If this building was our universe and is shaped about like this, our universe, like a fried egg, <laughs> no reflection on your building, brother. <laughs> But this is the best way to conceive of it. If that was the end of it, just our galaxy, and there are billions of galaxies as big or bigger than ours, and each galaxy has billions of suns as big or bigger than our sun, the sun's a thousand times bigger than our Earth. So if you started there, it'd take you 100,000 years going at the rate of 186,000 miles a second. Billions of galaxies. That's just our galaxy, and our Earth is tucked in there, little speck, pinpoint. Billions of stars in ours, billions of galaxies. 
and every one of them rushing away from one another at tremendous rates of speed. Space must be pretty big that God created. In fact, it's boggling the minds and has of the astronomers for centuries, and now they've come up with a new theory that maybe it's like an accordion. It's expanding, and then after billions of years, it'll contract on itself and just goes back and forth. And the new theory is there was never any beginning. Well, only problem with that, they've applied that truth to the wrong entity. God had no beginning, and he created this. But they can't fathom how billions of galaxies, and remember, ours is not the biggest, and it takes 100,000 years traveling at 186,000 miles a second just to get across it, billions like that, all traveling at tremendous rates of speed away from one another. Now, think how big a galaxy is. It'd take a lot of space just for ours. Billions of galaxies, and they're all rushing away from one another into outer space. Well, space is pretty big. But God says he fills heaven and earth, and he means all of the heavens and all of the earth and galaxies and whatever. He's talking about one, two, third heaven. Omnipresence. Now the New Testament also shows omnipresence of God over in Acts chapter 17, where Paul ran into that altar that said to an unknown God, and he started preaching a little sermon, and he ended up teaching that God is omnipresent. Verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men hands as though he needed anything, seeing that he gives to all life and breath and all things. Then down to verse 27, he desires that all men should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him, and find him, now look at this, though he be not far from every one of us. Now that's omnipresent. In other words, they should be seeking God and they won't have to look very far because he's right here anyway. Amen. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we should not think of the Godhead as like into silver, gold, or stone graven by art and man's device. In other words, he's told us here that God is not like man. He doesn't need anything. In other words, you can't worship him with your hands or with devices of men. You can't make a statue or image of him, he's saying here, and worship that and call that God. In other words, he's implying through all of this that God is spirit and that God is omnipresent. And therefore, that implies that God is not like man, nor needs anything like man, nor is he like gold, silver, anything you can make. He's unmade. He's spirit. So there we have spirit and omnipresence. Those things are all there when you read the Bible sometimes. Meditate on them. Another thing from a doctrine of the Bible shows that God is spirit is his invisibility. He said to be invisible... In Colossians 1.15, 1 Timothy 1.17, Hebrews 11.27, God is said to be invisible. Now, only spirit can be and remain invisible without hiding. Anything material has to try to counterfeit God's invisibility. So we try to hide. I mean, not necessarily always in a bad sense. You try to make yourself invisible if you just want a day off. You might hide somewhere. But see, we're counterfeiting what God is. The very fact that he's invisible tells us he's spirit, because only spirit can be invisible without hiding, without trying. Man cannot make himself invisible. He can only attempt to duplicate what God is, spirit. 
God who is invisible has the power to make himself visible, but man who is visible has no power to make himself invisible. And the reason is he is in spirit. Now, is Jesus an exception? That is, before his resurrection and glorified state, when, of course, in that body he can be visible or invisible at will. But is he an exception? Because we have passages where he seems to disappear to escape his enemies. I like that. But is that his power to make himself invisible? Or is it God blinding or veiling the eyes of his enemies? It's probably the latter because, remember, Philippians 2 said he emptied himself of his divine prerogatives, not of being God. You can't cease to be God if you're God anymore. You can cease to be a human if you're human or a dog if you're a dog. I don't care how many tricks a dog can do. It isn't anything but a dog. It isn't a cat. It isn't a Mercedes Benz. It's a dog. But... Jesus, in his humanity, said he emptied himself, said he could do nothing except by the power of the Spirit, which made a true humanity out of it. Therefore, he lived by total faith and obedience. But we got a couple of passages we can look at before we answer that fully, or try to. Luke 4, 28 to 30. We have passages like this where he becomes invisible. Or it's implied that he does. Luke 4, 28 to 30. And of course, in Luke 4, he's telling them he's the Messiah. They don't like that. And other things he says, he told them truth. They don't like. And all that were in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill whereupon the city was built that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. Now they've got a hold of him. There's the mob. You know, think of the hostages over there. Why don't they walk away? Why don't they pass out of the midst of those? Then another passage where he does that is John 8, 56 to 59. Jesus is here telling the Pharisees, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said unto him, You're not fifty years old, and how could you have seen Abraham? Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you before, Abraham was ego I me. <laughs> Greek students, ego I me. Before Abraham was, I existed. I am. He didn't say I was, just I am. You know the I am of Exodus? Moses says, what's your name? Just tell him I am. I exist. I am the self-existent one. Then they took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Now you can't hide yourself behind a pillar in the temple and go through the midst of them. So it means he hid himself and became invisible. I looked the Greek up. It generally pays if you're going to try to, you know, prove something. And the Greek is passive. He was hidden. So it didn't say he hid himself. It says he was hidden, which seems to imply in this passage that God veiled their eyes so they couldn't see him. Because remember, he's in his humanity. I'm suggesting that's what is really happening here in his humanity. It doesn't matter if you want to believe that he hid himself. Became invisible. But here are two passages where he walked right through their midst. Can you imagine an angry mob? They're ready to kill him twice. And they can't see him. Now, I know of a case. I heard it on tape when I first received the baptism of a charismatic, of course, missionary in South America. And he was captured, I believe, by a tribe of cannibals. But anyway, they had him in this hut, well guarded. I think some were inside, but I know two were right outside the door with their spears. And they were going to kill him the next morning. And as he sat there, this charismatic missionary, because anyone else would think he's hearing voices, the Lord said, I want you to get up and leave walk out of the hut and go to such and such a place. 
you know, and he knew where it was by the river. I want you to hold a revival there. It's going to save a lot of people. Now, this is an audible voice talking to him because he wouldn't imagine this in a thousand years. <laughs> well, he said, Lord, look at them all sitting there, and I think there were two inside watching him besides the ones outside. But it doesn't matter. He couldn't get out. And he said, they're sitting there. I couldn't budge without them knowing it. He said, I said, go. When God says go, you better go. <laughs> or he might let them eat you. So he said, all right, Lord, you say go. I don't understand it. And he got up and just walked right past them, invisible. As far as their eyes were concerned, they were veiled. You see, he didn't become invisible, only to them. I mean, there he was. He could see himself and them, but they couldn't see him. Well, the rest of the story we can use for some other illustration sometime because it is tremendous. He went where God said, and they never did see him. He just walked right past them. They had a big revival, and supernatural things took place there. And by the way, when he got there, the natives a couple of days later found him and were going to kill him for sure this time, but supernatural things took place. And this time he didn't become invisible. God just did some supernatural things, and they got saved. They were the revival, his captors. <laughs> the objects of it. But anyway, there's a case. That seems to be what happened in the case of Jesus because it says in the Greek he was hidden. Now in the other passage, it does say that, you know, he passed out of their midst. It doesn't imply he was hidden in that passage. So six of one, half a dozen of the other, you stay with the humanity of Jesus. Then the passage there in John seems to tell us what is happening. God veils the eyes of his enemies, like this missionary. Why wouldn't he just make the missionary invisible if that's the way he's going to do it? But he veils the eyes of the people so they can't see him. Now that may be helpful to know sometime because you can still see you and see your enemies and God will say, just walk out. Just walk right between them. See those two over there, the ones with the big guns? <laughs> and the two knives? That's the two I want you to walk between. Well, having known that Jesus did it and it's still happening, I mean, that testimony is not way back in the 1800s in the days of the sailboats when missionaries went out and all those unusual supernatural things always happened way back when. No, that's right in the 20th century. In fact, I've still got the tape somewhere where he tells of it. We're saying scriptures say God is invisible and Jesus seemed to make himself invisible, and it seems from the Greek that God veiled the eyes of his enemies, because that's the experience that's happened since then. But when the Russian cosmonaut, the first one that went up, you remember, and orbited, went a few miles out in orbit, when they came back, of course, Russians are atheistic, and with a big cynical laugh and smile, in their atheistic skepticism, they said, well, we were up in the heavens, but we didn't see God. Which only proves that what the scriptures say about God is true, that he's invisible. <laughs> they were about a millimeter out in space. Remember the vastness of the universe we just described to you? It's just next to infinite. It's so big. In fact, even scientists know nothing can be infinite. If they believe in God, they know only God could be. So that's why they're coming up with the theory that they'll go trillions and billions and hundreds of trillions of trillions of miles in that direction, then suddenly they'll start coming back. And then they'll just do that, you know, for eternity. It never had a beginning. It'll never cease. But you still have to raise the question, where did it all come from? But all of this vastness of space, these cosmonauts, just a millimeter out in this vast space, he might as well have looked for God with a Palomar telescope. He'd have seen him just as easy with that as going a millimeter out in the vastness of space and say, well, I didn't see God. Anyway, God's in a third heaven, a spiritual dimension. The scriptures say God's invisible. So all they proved is what the scriptures say, that you can't see God. No man has seen God at any time, not even a Russian cosmonaut. <laughs> but the only begotten son or the unique son of God, he hath declared him. The only way that Russian or anyone else will ever see God is to see him in his word. And they don't believe that. 
see God in the face of Jesus Christ. So we've said that the scriptures declare in doctrine, by declaration, even by implication, that God is spirit because he's eternal, because he's omnipresent, because he's invisible. Now that speaks of spirit. Nothing created can be invisible. Because even when that missionary was invisible to his captors, he wasn't invisible, really, their eyes were veiled. Because matter is not spirit and therefore cannot be invisible. Now you say, well, God could have made him invisible. Well, go ahead. But whatever God does doesn't change the fact that only spirit is invisible. Jesus said God is spirit. But what is spirit? So we have to spend some time tonight in answering that question. What is spirit? Now, we're not saying what is God as spirit. We've already dealt with that to some extent. We'll deal with it more later. We're not dealing with the fact that man has a spirit. We're just raising the question, what is spirit? If you said what is matter or a created object, then you'd be describing something material and finite. But we're talking about what is spirit as over against what is visible, finite matter. Someone once asked a religious teacher that question, what is spirit? And his reply was, spirit has no shape, no size, no color, no weight, and it does not occupy space. Spirit has no shape, size, color, weight, and it's not occupying any space. You know, space is created for material objects. To which the inquirer replied, that's the best definition of nothing I've ever heard. Now, we're not talking about God as spirit, just what is spirit? But it isn't a definition of nothing. It's an attempt to define another kind of reality than we are familiar with. That's what he was trying to do. He was trying to define another dimension of reality. See, spirit is just as real as matter. In fact, it's more real, but I'm merely contrasting. Spirit is just as real as what you can see. It's just another dimension. So how do you describe that that exists in another dimension? Or that is another kind of reality that you've never experienced? Let's say that spirit is, and then we'll try to define all of that. Spirit is invisible, immaterial, spaceless, and immortal. Spirit is invisible, immaterial, spaceless, immortal. Now you see, when you say it's immaterial, then right away, what are you going to define it by or with? Because all you know, all that you know, even smoke or fog, is still material. But spirit is immaterial. Absolutely consisting of nothing that we can define or use an analogy and say, now, this is what spirit's like. It's not like smoke or fog or wind. Jesus, by analogy, says the work of the spirit is like the movement of the wind in the trees, but he isn't calling the Holy Spirit wind, although the term spirit and wind are interchangeable in Scripture. We'll come to that later. But you're trying to describe something invisible, that means you haven't seen it. Immaterial, you've never experienced it. Spaceless, and you can't conceive of anything not existing in space because if you didn't have space, it couldn't exist. There'd be no room for it. Even the smallest, tiniest molecule has to have space because it's material or matter. We're trying to describe something immortal, and we don't experience immortality. We will, but I mean, we had a beginning, so we don't know what immortal is. You know, when you've been there 10,000 years, you'll begin to know by experience what you believe now by faith, but it's not something you've experienced. You can't experience immortality as a finite being. You had a beginning. You will experience it. I don't want to have to put 15 footnotes to every statement because we're talking about 
things we don't know anything about <laughs> except what the Bible shows us. You want to define spirit? It isn't an easy job. But we're going to help you so that you will do what Jesus said in John 4, 24. God is spirit. And he's seeking people who will worship him in an acceptable manner. He says he's seeking men and women who will worship him in spirit and in truth because he's spirit. You see, there's something about what he said when he said God is spirit that he wanted you to know that first before he said here is acceptable worship and everything else. He's rejecting all of those idols and rituals and formalized programs every Sunday that men call worship. He's looking. He even seeks people, he says, who will worship him in spirit. In the spirit. Shalom Oh, in the spirit. He didn't say spiritually, religiously. Well, we won't get ahead of the story too far, but without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you make a feeble effort at best. I don't care how pious you are, how good you can sing. You may be the leading voice in the choir, whatever. You'll have a very hard time even coming close to worshiping God in the Spirit. And you don't have to sing in the Spirit to worship God in the Spirit. Just pray in the Spirit like Paul says. I pray in the Spirit more than you all. Of course, there's a place with the understanding. And so, what are the implications of Jesus' words when he said, God is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit for the Father seeking such to worship him. He's not seeking all that dead ritual. Beautiful choirs. He's seeking people to worship him who can worship him in spirit as well as truth. He's pointing right to those temples, those Samaritan temples, and he refers to the temple in Jerusalem. He says that isn't worshiping God in spirit. And look at the temples they're putting up today. They call that church. Church is the people. Well, we'll look at them one at a time. We've already dealt somewhat with the invisibility of God, so you know what it means to be invisible. So, what is spirit? First of all, it's invisible. If you can see it, it isn't spirit. Now, that ought to be enough and we could move on, but that probably won't be enough. If you can see it, it isn't spirit. What is spirit? First of all, it's invisible. Now, if you do see it, then one of two things took place. When the two dimensions merge, the visible and the invisible, so that you see the invisible, then what has happened? Well, one of two things. If you're conscious when you see the invisible, when I mean by conscious, you're not in the spirit or in a trance like Peter in Acts 10. If you're conscious and you're seeing the invisible with your eyes open, and that does happen, Jesus appears, an angel will appear. I'm not talking about a vision now. We'll get to that later. It means not that your eyes see the invisible because these eyes can't see the invisible. Even though sometimes, even in Scripture, it is said God opened his eyes and he saw the angel, you know. But what's happening, the invisible, which has the power to do this, makes himself visible to your sight. See, you're still seeing the pillar, the light and all, but there stands Jesus, or there stands the angel. Now, don't confuse that with getting caught up in the spirit that comes later, doesn't it? We have to stay with one thing at a time. So spirit is invisible. If you see it, it isn't spirit. But in those exceptional times when you do see it, and it is spirit, then it's because spirit has made itself visible. See, even in a seance, a medium can go into a trance and things begin to appear because of the ectoplasm which the medium transmits in the trance state. Things can form out of that psychic power and do appear in seances. But it's because you see the spirit, even in this case, spirits who are masquerading as deceased loved ones and that sort of thing. 
the spirits, the demons are making themselves visible to those people who are not in a trance or whatever. They're sitting there looking in the seance, in the dark room. So we're trying to emphasize that if you can see it, it isn't spirit. But if you do see it, it's because the spirit is making itself visible, because spirit is invisible. And by whatever means and for whatever reason, whether it's false occult or whether it's genuine angel appearing or whatever, they are making themselves visible to you. Now, in a second way, if you see the Spirit, it's when you are in the Spirit, like John in the book of Revelation, or Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, caught up in the Spirit, or in a trance, like Peter says he was in a trance in Acts 10. Not that what he saw, he saw a vision, is following the analogy of what we're talking about, but I just use the term trance because it does occur in the Bible and doesn't always refer to something I'll quote. And in that case, then your spirit can see spirit because you're in that dimension. Like Paul caught up and he saw the things in the spirit. So all we're trying to do is to help you understand that spirit is invisible. You can't see spirit. And so whenever you do, and some have, we're not talking about visions and so forth. We're talking about seeing the spirit. The spirit has no visibility. It's not like anything you can compare it to, smoke or whatever, because you can see smoke however thin. It's invisible. So keep that in mind, it's invisible. If you see it, it's because something supernatural has taken place. When those two dimensions merge supernaturally, visible and invisible, it's because the invisible has made itself visible. It has the power to do that. Remember, we've already said, you can't make yourself invisible, but spirit can make itself visible. So, invisible. Secondly, immaterial. Spirit is immaterial. Now remember, in all of these things, we don't know them in experience. We're just trying to understand what Jesus said when he said, God is spirit, because everybody you know, and including some of you, and I hope you're delivered of it, always think of God as that picture that somebody painted of Jesus. Or some statue, if you came out of Catholicism. Or that so-called statue of Christ down there in Buenos Aires in South America. You always conjure up something in your mind. You can't conceive of God. As far as appearance, he makes it plain that he does not want you to try to conceive of him in any human or created form of anything. Not even a dove, he says. Yes, he mentions that. Not even a bird. Charismatics, every time you see the bird, the Holy Spirit. That isn't the Holy Spirit. Well, anyway, we're talking about something immaterial, spirit. Now, the material body, for example, has parts. By contrast, material things take a body. It has parts, eyes to see, ears to hear, legs to walk, lungs to breathe heart to circulate the blood, parts. But you can't divide the spirit up into parts. You see, there is no element of spirit which is not the whole essence of spirit. Because it's immaterial. You can't divide something up that's immaterial. Go ahead and try. You can even chop smoke up into little pieces. It'll flit around, but you can cut it up. If you're fast enough to move your hands through a little pile of smoke coming off the campfire, you can divide it. But you can't divide spirit up because it's immaterial. How do you divide something that has no parts? Even the resurrection body isn't going to have a heart, our stomach, our lungs, our reproductive organs, go on, name the rest. It'll be a new glorified body. We know not what it'll be like, we're told, but it'll be like his. 
not need a heart because the heart circulates the blood and we're told flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God. So anyway, it's immaterial. Now when you think of God as spirit, you can see why that we teach here you can't divide God up. He eternally manifests himself as Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but it's one spirit, one eternal divine spirit that eternally manifests himself as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus could say, I and the Father are one, one spirit. And before he took upon a human form, you see, he didn't even have a body. Now, God can manifest himself in heaven to us any way he wants. He sits on a throne, but he fills the universe, he says. How can he do that? He's spirit. If he wants to manifest himself to people, to the angels, when I say manifest in a veiled form because no one has seen God at any time. I know of three cases where they said they were before the throne, but you don't see the Father. The Son will manifest himself, but not the Father. You just know he's there. Eternal light. But anyway, what we're saying is that the triunity of God is an example of how that spirit cannot be divided up because God is not divided. That's a basic tenet of biblical Christianity, also covered in biblical theology. Some of you got a lot of homework to do. Spirit, we said, is spaceless. Now, if you think you had trouble with something being invisible, that's hard enough to conceive. I tried to explain to you, if you see the invisible, it's not spirit. <laughs> and those exceptions is spirit manifesting itself to you, taking on temporary form, and then going right back to invisibility. That was hard enough then to be immaterial. We don't know of anything that's immaterial. You can't even think of the thinnest substance that's immaterial. Because everything consists of atoms, even the air you breathe. It's matter. Well, if you think that's hard, it gets progressively harder. Spirit is spaceless. See, all you know is that, well, here's a pulpit, there's a chair, here I am, you say, you're occupying space. Something which is immaterial does not occupy space. To give you an example, here's a book. Now, you see where it's located? That's occupying space. I can move it wherever I want in space up to certain limits. See, this is here now. Now watch. I can't put another book in that space because it's occupied. No matter how I try, it won't go because material objects have to have space or there aren't any material objects because how could you have something with no place for it to exist? But you see, spirit being immaterial is spaceless. It doesn't need space. It isn't occupying any space. It's immaterial. But anything created has to have space, and it doesn't matter how small it is, even a molecule, yea, even the invisible atom, almost invisible, it is to the naked eye, Yet, even that little atom, you can put a trillion of them on the head of a pin. I believe it's the point of a pin. Doesn't matter, there's still a lot of them. A trillion on the point of a pin, but every one of those little tiny things have a certain amount of spread, so they need space. Just like you've got a certain amount of spread. <laughs> we won't carry that further because this is not a course in dry, wry humor. But you see, if there was no space, then created objects could not exist. Remember what we've taught you? That God created space, not for himself or angels who are spirits, but for the things he would create. He had to make the space before he made the first speck of dust, because he had to have a place to put it. As soon as matter exists, it has to have 
some space to exist in. But as immaterial spirit, having no parts, having no weight, having no dimension, having no spread, spirit doesn't need space. Space is superfluous to spirit. The only time spirit ever needs space is when it makes itself visible to you for some reason. What is space? Space is emptiness. And certainly you don't think that emptiness is necessary for a spirit to exist in. Well, it's going to help you understand what God is. He's not what you can conceive with your own head and mind. He is spirit, and he said, I want you to worship me Amen. in harmony or befitting what I am, spirit. I want you to worship me in spirit because I am spirit. Well, I forgot my flashlight, so I can't give you a demonstration. But we're talking about space is emptiness. Spirits are spaceless. And so if I had a flashlight, see, we could turn the lights out and you'd get a beam of light here. Then I'd put another beam across this light. And all it does is go right through it. See, light doesn't occupy space. I could put a third one over here, and they would just converge and go right on about their own business. You get a spot out there, spot out there, spot up here. I could put 10 lights converging. I could put 10,000, and they would never interfere with one another because light doesn't need space. By the way, God's light. God is light. And just keep multiplying those beams, you see, converging through one another is what I'm talking about. You'll never get to the place where you fill up that point where they converge with too much light and no more can get through. Now, demons are spirits. Like angels are spirit, God is spirit, demons are spirits. And I remember several years ago in a city where I was teaching regularly, a woman I might have been teaching on deliverance. She said, I want to share something with you. I was sitting in a meeting, not ours, and she said, as I looked this person in front of me, I saw demons in that person, this man. And it helped understand Jesus' remarks in Mark chapter 5 where the man had the legion. Now, a legion is 2,000, so he was occupied by hordes of demons. We can assume at least 2,000 because his name, the demon said, my name's Legion, we are many. She said, I saw those demons swarming in him and around him like bees, except they were with shape and form and demons. Which helps you understand that spirits don't occupy space. He might have had 100 or 10,000 in him. And a lot of people have a lot of them. But they don't occupy space. They say, how could that man have a legion of demons in him? Because spirits don't occupy space. They just, like beams of light, can flow through one another. And of course, in this case, they were being made visible to her by God, showing her this. But until God made them visible to her eyesight, or we can say opened her eyes to see them, however you want to term it, they were invisible. And they don't occupy space. That's how you can go through a deliverance session with a person and like a hundred demons come out if you want to stay there all night. It's because there could be a hundred thousand. So spirit is spaceless, which helps you understand Mark 5 a little better, I hope. Spirit is immortal. Now material objects can be changed in form. Unlike spirit, material objects can be changed in form. The easiest illustration is water. You can freeze it and make ice, that's a different form. You can boil it and get steam, that's a different form. You can condense the steam, you get water, and then you can freeze it. You can go in those three forms over and over. So material objects can change. The tree out in the field, the plants, the flowers, your body is in a process of change and eventually will go back to the dust, you see. Because all created our material objects are in the process of change and decay, going back to dust. But spirit is immortal because it cannot be changed to anything else or reduced to anything else. 
And the reason is spirit is the basic essence. And when you get to the basic essence of anything, then you can't do anything else with it or make it anything else or less. So spirit cannot be changed into anything else. It can't be broken up into parts like your body or a chair, like a material object. Spirit remains the whole self all the time. Spirit is the basic essence. There isn't anything it can be changed to or reduced to. Think of the analogy of the light again. That's the basic essence. And so there's nothing else you can reduce light to. It's immaterial and spaceless. Now, we said spirit is immortal for the simple reason that that is the basic essence and it can't be changed into or reduced to anything else like created things. Not only can, but are changing. That's why it's immortal. When you get down to spirit, that's the basic essence. And see, God always was. God is eternal. God is spirit. God always was because that's the basic essence out of which everything else was made or created. Now, don't stumble over that because Psalm 104 says that he sends forth his spirit and the grass and flowers begin to sprout forth. He takes away his spirit and they die. So spirit is the basic essence. Now, I didn't say a blade of grass had a spirit, and I'm not going to try to explain what I didn't say either. It's in Psalm 104. In other words, without the basic essence, there would be nothing. God is the basic essence. That's why he said, I am. He could say, I'm eternal spirit, and he does say those things in his word, but he just said to Moses, tell them I am. When Jesus comes along, and by the way, that's Jesus pre-incarnate talking to Moses. Remember, Abraham saw Jesus' day. That's before Moses. And God called Abraham. That was Jesus. So in the New Testament, in John 8, when Jesus says, I am, he just said what he said to Moses. And that's the same as saying, I am the basic essence of all things. I am being. I am eternal being, our spirit. Now, the relation of immortality to time, we're talking about immortality. That must mean it's timeless or eternal or something or both or one or the other. What is the relation between immortality and time? Now, we're thinking of spirit as being immortal. Well, immortality of spirit, as we've already shown, it is immortal unlike created matter, is not affected by time. Spirit is not affected by time. Your body is, which has the spirit from God, but spirit itself is not affected by time. And it's either alive unto God, and thus it will spend eternity in heaven, or it's dead unto God and will spend eternity in hell. But in any case, it's immortal because it's spirit. That's why the scriptures teach that soul, spirit, is or are immortal. Now why is spirit not affected by time? It's because time is measurement of change. If your watch stops, it won't give you time. Why? Because time measures change. Now, everything created in the universe is in the process of change. The earth, your body, the fruit tree, the air you breathe in this room, the temperature of this room, every second it's in the process of change. Whether you can always measure it is beside the point. It is changing. And so time was created when the universe and space were created. Why did God have to create time when he created the universe and space? Is because as soon as he created an object to put in that space, it began to change. 
going toward decay and final extinction or into another form. So time was necessary or else rocks and people and bugs would be eternal and immortal. And of course, that's impossible. So he had to create time to measure and record the change that takes place. It's impossible to have a created order without time. But God doesn't need time because he's eternal. And that's why we said that it's an error to think of eternity as endless time. Time and eternity are two different concepts. Now that is in detail in biblical theology, but it was necessary to say a few things about it at this stage. And of course, the concept of spirit not changing, being immortal, ruins Seventh-day Adventist theology concerning the annihilation of the wicked. Because if you know what spirit is, you'd never fall into that blunder because you can't annihilate what's immortal. You can't burn up what is immaterial. And their doctrine teaches that the spirits and souls, the person, body, soul, and spirit, will perish in hell. They teach annihilation. Well, you can get rid of the body, but you're not going to get rid of the spirit because spirit is immortal. It's going to spend eternity somewhere, but it's immortal. Well, that's a good place to stop. Let you meditate over that. And then we're going to be getting into what are the implications of Jesus' statement in John 4.24. This will help you to understand why God isn't what you are. He gave you of himself when he saved you. But God is spirit. And even in the New Testament, man is like the flower of the field. Today, here, tomorrow, gone. But God and his word are eternal. They abide forever. Now, that doesn't, so say, imply what everyone could dream up about what you said. Of course, those who are born again have eternal life. But God, even in the New Testament, contrasts what we are with what he is. And I've been preaching it for years that you'll never obey John 4.24 in any institution or religious system of man But we ought to be a church that learns how to worship God in an acceptable manner. And that's why Jesus spent a whole chapter talking about it. Well, God bless you. We'll see you Sunday.